right, here we are, another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudair, local realtor here in Ottawa, and I'm joined today with my one of my best friends, actually. We've been <laughs> best friends for probably over 25 years, Garam Mahfouz. Without aging are ourselves. <laughs> I'm well, how are you? Doing fantastic. Garam is also a business owner of Spark Empathy. Correct. And I wanted to bring her on the show today just because my focus for this show is really just letting know, you know, people around Ottawa, letting them know about the businesses that we have, mm-hmm. what we do, and what Ottawa is all about, yep. and the fact that it's not boring and there's so much going for this city. With that being said, Garam, what I would like to do is I'd like to start with you to just kind of give me a bit of a sort of the 10,000 foot overview of the business, Spark Empathy. Absolutely. So the 10,000 foot overview is basically that every organization, regardless of whether it's a business, it could be in the government, it could be in other organizations as well, need uh, key leadership skills. Mm -hmm. And one of the key leadership skills, uh, according to research, is empathy. So I founded the organization uh, Spark Empathy so that I can basically train conflict coach individuals as well as organizations on how to use emotional intelligence on a day-to-day basis for their leadership skills. So for the audience listening, would you classify it as more of a coaching or what could you classify the business as? So I would classify it as a training and workshop type business, Mm -hmm. coaching as well. However, a lot of the coaching can be applied to the, like I said, to the individual level, but it can also be applied in group settings. So workshops are one of the things that I do the most. And it is something that I think every organization needs, whether it's policing or it's policy or it's small to medium enterprises, I find that if you have those skills and emotional intelligence, you'll be able to succeed a lot better if you don't than if you didn't. And if you have to just kind of peel the onion a little bit on the business side of things, tell me how long have you been in business? What's sort of your perfect client, ideal client? Yeah, so it's funny because it is a business. However, I always think of it as a small organization that I'm hoping one day the future generations will take on and kind of make it grow. The clients that I have, a lot of them are actually federal government clients uh, because right now emotional intelligence is very important within the federal government, but also in the private sector, you're seeing a lot of people training in not only emotional intelligence, but in the mental health aspect because they're realizing that mental health is very important if they want their employees to be doing well. And as you know, as a business, you know, uh, owner yourself, that if you, if you take care of the people that work for you, they're most likely going to go the extra mile for you down the road. And just on the emotional intelligence uh, as a, you know, massive, broad sort of definition, could you maybe define it a little bit for us? Absolutely. So this term has become very popular recently. However, it's been around for, for a while. And it basically refers to a person's ability to be able to manage stressful situations and continue to be functional and successful using the skills that they have in emotional intelligence, which includes self-management, empathy. Uh, It includes a positive outlook. There are different layers to it. However, the broad term emotional intelligence refers to your uh, ability to be able to manage emotions during stressful situations, most importantly. And what are some of the most interesting clients that you've worked with? And you don't have to tell me sort of names or anything, but just more of like their background you know, that kind of stuff, the makeup of that client. Yeah, so I've actually worked with specific politicians and uh, it's very interesting because the same training that I would give an organization, I would actually tailor it and give it differently to um, different people. And in terms of uh, politicians, one of the issues that I often found uh, when coaching was that they lack the ability to sometimes fully connect with their the people that... Uh, they are representing and oftentimes their words get kind of taken in different ways when they're in the public eye and the media Mm -hmm. so one of even though they're they have a very good um, ability to problem solve they have a very good ability to be able to get certain things done that they want to get done sometimes what they really need is to be able to connect with the people that they represent and so that would require skills and empathy as well yeah and someone had mentioned to me once is like emotion intelligence is the ability to connect without necessarily words. So I, I don't know that I would say that that's what it is. That's communication. 
communication, 80% of communication is body language. Subtle, yeah. It's, uh, it, like you said, it's very subtle. And uh, I would say in terms of having good communication, it's important to understand how good communication works. However, I wouldn't say that that's what uh, emotional intelligence mm. is. If you want to look at it, in terms of, if you want to compare it actually to academic intelligence. So let's say you are studying for an exam and you want to get a good mark in, on the, that exam. Now, a lot of people think it's the smartest people in the room that are going to do well on the exam. That's actually not the case. Yeah. Sometimes it's the person with the highest emotional intelligence that will do well. And the reason is because they are able to manage their emotions when the exam comes. So when they sit down on the table and are writing the exam, they're able to manage their yeah. emotions. And so emotional intelligence actually predicts success by f far more than academic intelligence would. It's funny you say that. I was watching Suits actually the other day yeah. and I was, uh, there's this clip in Suits where Rachel's like, I can't manage to do the exam. Very, very smart individual, but just can't manage to do the exam. And that's essentially what, that's what essentially you're referring what it to. Is. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just that you freak out once you get into the exam and that, you know, you don't have that ability to regulate your emotions, to just be like, I'm present, I'm here, I'm just going to do this and do the best I can. Absolutely. Kind of and and that's, that's key. And it's not just key for students, of course, it's key for everyone who's trying to basically accomplish some sort of goal. And I would say that, you know, sometimes when we think of leadership, we think of it in terms of just business owners or managers. No, I would say that the majority of people have some sort of leadership role in their life. So they could be the head of their household. They could be a leader amongst their friends, their community. So I think it's something that if every person hones in on, mm -hmm. it would be for the greater good. It's interesting actually you say that about leaders. Like a lot of the times you, you could tell, you could spot a leader walking into a room without them saying a word. So I'm going to ask you a question. What, is it, what makes you notice a leader? It's that ability to just be a little bit stoic. They're very, like, they're sure of themselves. They know exactly what the next step is going to be. They walk into the room and they've already kind of sized up everybody without necessarily saying a word. They know what they're going to do. Absolutely. And they know who they're going to talk to. And they're not, like, here to, you know, take off anybody, but they're just here to kind of, just, they're here. Yep. Simple as that. I and think people that's right. get drawn to them because of that ability to just be able to just walk in, read the room and still kind of function like a normal human being. And I think it's the biggest thing to do with that is just that emotional intelligence. I would abs uh, like agree 100%. You used a couple of words that I think are actually really good at describing emotional intelligence and leadership in emotional intelligence. One of the things that you said was a leader walks in the room and they read the room. So that's understanding, and that mm -hmm. requires empathy to be able to read the room, yeah. because you have to be able to tune in to other people's emotions, their facial expressions, and whatnot. Yeah. Another thing that you said was stoic, which basically is referring to uh, a leader's ability to be present, and be calm, and be able to connect with people, even though they're probably feeling really stressed out about mm -hmm. whatever the situation is. And it's the, the, definitely like a one of the things that I've used to notice with some of the leaders that I've had in the past is like they walk in the room, they already know Sally's upset. Mark is feeling a little bit of a pinch. So and so is not even engaged. And, and then that's something that they just kind of bring to the table. And then when they're talking and that conversation gets started, they really are paying attention to the fact that Sally's not, you know, she's having some, you know, she's not even here. Yeah. Um, and then they bring her back by saying things like, you know, kind of getting her engaged and things like that. So that's, that to me is emotional intelligence in a way. Absolutely. And actually what you're describing is very good leadership skills because a lot of times, uh, I would say if you to look at a good manager and a bad manager, a good manager is someone who was able to get a bad employee to do good. A bad manager is someone who would just give up on that employee. Mm -hmm. And so what you're describing is really similar to what it takes to, basically keep your employees engaged and just noticing just the small little things sometimes is is enough or even having like just asking that question Sally what's going on with you um I noticed you know you're you're not around is there something that we can do to support you and then Sally might say well you know um I have a sick uh, family member or something like that is it okay if I work in the evening instead of the day yeah, yeah. it could be small little changes like that but that shows the person that you're dealing with that you're invested in what's best for them as well 
it's really all about just like we said earlier, figuring out the subtleties, those 80% of the conversations that are not being spoken. Oh, absolutely. You know, the body language, the shrugs, the, you know, the movement, the eye movement, all of that stuff, like the, the weird smile, yep. the smirk or the smile, like all of that stuff is really what makes emotional intelligence, for me at least, what it's all about. It's Abs- just absolutely. figuring out those subtleties. Absolutely. So how long have you been doing this, Ram? So I started, I founded the organization in 2018. However, in terms of conflict coaching and mediation and coaching in general, I've been doing that since 2010. Conflict coaching. Conflict That's a coaching. massive heading by itself. Tell me a little bit more about that. So uh, conflict coaching is basically um, coaching an individual towards a solution for something that is ailing them. A lot of times when people are in a stressful situation, they tend to spin. It's something we all do. It's very human nature. And so a conflict coach would go in there and it's not counseling. So we're not counseling the person. We're not trying to... Um, console them or anything like that we're trying to get them to reach a solution that is best for them so we basically find out what the problem is and then we allow them to see what the problem is and then we allow them to figure out what the solution is so it's more like in a way uh, maybe i'm let me let me see if i'm actually on the right track with this it's putting it in perspective for them and and to kind of just say like here's the problem yeah it might sound like it's a massive problem but here's the problem What are the solutions? Let's figure out those solutions together kind of thing. 100%. And it's a question that you would ask is, well, what do you do if this continues? What, I mean, if it's a big issue for them, they're going to have to figure out what the solution is. Yeah. Eventually. And so sometimes it's putting in the perspective of, okay, if we don't figure out a solution now, what will the consequences be in the future if we haven't dealt with this now? Mm -hmm. And it's something that is applied to so many different areas could be on the individual scale, yeah. could be on the community scale as well. Is it fair to say, like when you say conflict resolution or conflict, you know, coaching. management or yeah. coaching, is it fair to say that it's not just a conflict with someone else? Like you don't need two people to have a conflict sometimes. No. Sometimes it might be just within. A lot of times it, it is within. Yeah. And that's what you're going to realize with the, with the EQ training or emotional, uh, also known as emotional intelligence training. And you, uh, with conflict coaching as well, you realize that a lot of times the problem is within because it's the individual who has the problem. Mm -hmm. And so they're the ones who are dwelling on the issue that is kind of happening with them. And then sometimes with conflict coaching, what you'll realize is that there's also, sorry, there's uh, a lot of common denominators, which is this person might find themselves in these situations very often. So that means that they haven't developed the emotional intelligence skills they need to be able to get themselves out yeah. of that situation. And I find a lot of the times situations like that, the, the individuals will start feeling like that victim mentality and like, this always happens to me. I'm, I'm never too good for this. I'm, you know, just that kind of stuff that, the, like you said, you start spinning out of control. Yep. What would you say to the folks that are watching? Like, what can we do ourselves to, you know, start kind of, gaining those emotional intelligence? So that's a really good question. I would say for the first step, for those who are able to, I would say the first step is to start self-management and to start creating some sort of self-awareness around their habits Mm -hmm. and their personality, their emotions. I would recommend for those who can, uh, and we're in Ottawa, so there's tons of people that are working in the government, either federal or provincial, and they have access to um, to tools such as uh, psychotherapy and that sort of thing. People think of psychotherapists as someone that you just go to for therapy, basically, but you can actually go to them to ask them to help you develop a plan towards self-awareness and towards gaining self-awareness but also towards gaining emotional intelligence because they absolutely have qualifications in that as well. I would definitely recommend that those who are finding themselves in situations where they're extending their empathy a bit too much to look up how to set boundaries. That's a big one. It's a huge one. Yeah that that to me, that has been a big one for, for quite some time. And it's a struggle at the end of the day. Absolutely. Like you just really have to, especially if you're an empathetic person, it's really hard for you to kind of separate and say, okay, I'm only going to allow this, for example, to take a certain amount of time out of my day. And then after that, I'm just not going to think about it anymore. Absolutely. Uh, or I'm only going to allow this person to really just kind of vent for me for about five to 10 minutes. And then after that, I'm just going to, thank you so much. I'm going to walk away kind of thing. So, so having known you for over t- like 20 years now, 
uh, without aging ourselves. One thing I do know is that you actually absolutely have honed your skills in empathy. And I think that you have a lot a very high emotional intelligence because you're able to read the room, you're able to understand what people are thinking, and you're able to extend compassion towards those that you feel need help. Yeah. Um, and that I've seen firsthand. The problem becomes when we feel we need to extend empathy towards those that don't necessarily need our empathy. Or I, I shouldn't say empathy, I should say compassion. And I'm just going to explain here. A lot of times when we talk about empathy, we talk about people think of sympathy and they think of compassion as well. Yeah. Sympathy is basically saying, oh, I feel sorry for your condition. Mm -hmm. And then you go home and you go about your day. Empathy is sitting down with you and saying, wow, that really sucks what you're going through and sitting down with you and kind of trying to understand things from your perspective, not saying, oh, I'm, if it were me, I would do it this way. No, it has nothing to do with that. It's how you would deal with the situation, how it's impacting you. Compassion is when you want to actually relieve that person of their suffering. Yeah. And so that's the part that we sometimes need to hold back on a little bit because we don't necessarily need to extend compassion to every situation. And so training in boundaries is a huge component of empathy training. Well, it's, it's massive. Like it's a massive difference between sitting there and understanding how someone is feeling, sitting there and understanding how someone is feeling and actually extending a hand. Absolutely. Sitting there and, and extending a hand and actually wanting to help. Yep. And I think sometimes a lot of us fall in that trap especially when you're having that sort of you know that relationship with like a narcissist or something like that a lot of empathetic people have that problem exactly and you're sitting there and you're like i really want to help them but you're getting in you're getting sucked into this vortex absolutely so one of the things that I do, and I've done this, and it kind of at first was a bit controversial when I first did one of my workshops, where I actually described what an empathetic person looks like and what a narcissistic person looks like. And in the workshop, there were directors and there were regular employees. It was different levels of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because those higher up were all not paying attention, looking at their phones, disengaged. Those who were not higher up were really engaged in trying to get everyone else listening to them. And so what, when I started describing narcissistic behavior, it was very interesting to see some of the people in the room kind of feel a, a little bit uncomfortable and kind of shift and realize, no way, I need to be a little bit more engaged. And those who were um, basically... Uh, I guess feeling like they're always the victim started realizing wait I have agency in my actions in what I do 100%. and I can't just allow things to happen to me all the time sometimes yeah. I have to take we action. always have agency and I, I feel like one of the biggest things that we all fall victim in uh, is that sense of victim mentality yep right like I'm Oh, this always happens to me. I always suck at this. I, I just, and that's a trap. Like we just can't get ourselves out of it unless we pull ourselves out of it. Absolutely. We have to. Nobody can pull us out of it. It no. has to be ourselves pulling us. It's something I actually say, not just, you know, in a professional setting, but in a personal setting all the time. I say that no one is going to come to save you. You need to save yourself. 100%. Um, however, having said that, we also need to realize that we live within a community. And so sometimes saving yourself means asking for help. And that's okay. Yeah. And that's one of the bigger things that I find a lot of the, the folks that I've you know, either experienced before, friends, whatever, PTSD, things like that, mm -hmm. they don't know when to put their hand up and say, I need help. Absolutely. And I'm one of those, like, don't get me wrong, I'm one of those people that I've, <laughs> I've suffered from it quite some time. It's like, I just, you know, you, you have this sort of ego where you're like, oh, I don't want to ask for help because yeah. I'm, I'm going to feel like I, I owe it to someone. Absolutely. I and mean, you have other personalities who ask for help all the time and sometimes they don't really need it, right? Or deserve it. Or deserve it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, like, both of us can't really judge who deserves or who doesn't deserve. But, I mean, we can, we can have opinions, I guess. And sometimes you're absolutely right. They don't deserve it. So what are some of the things that you would want to say to folks that are, you know, for example, having issues with boundaries and things like that? For those who have issues setting up boundaries, what I would say, it's something that will not feel good. You will have to do it regardless if it feels practice. good or doesn't feel good. So you need to practice. Yeah. That's something I say all the time. Yeah. And then, then that's the thing sometimes like um, what happens a lot of the times, those people are actually like, even inside the home, they're having issues with those boundaries. So Absolutely. it's, you got to start with the closest people to you, I think. Absolutely. And it's going to feel the most crucial, the most sort of like nails on a chalkboard kind of feeling uh -huh. for those people yeah. but you got to do it absolutely rip that bandit and start setting up the boundaries even if it's just as good as hey look don't call me after a certain hour yep uh, or hey look like i 
I really don't appreciate when you talk to me this way. Absolutely. You know, that kind of stuff. And, how do, and so what you're describing too is not just the idea of setting boundaries, but also follow through, right? Yeah. So don't call me after this hour because I won't answer. And then when they do call you at the hour, you just don't answer. And that's okay. I think a lot of times people are afraid of uh, setting boundaries because they're afraid of pushing people away. And setting boundaries actually makes people more respect. closer to you and respect you a lot more. 100%. Because now they know what they're dealing with. So that now they know, hey, if Fatty said, you know what, I'm, you know, Saturday mornings are family days. I'm busy Saturday mornings. That person will be comfortable enough to tell you, you know what? I, that's okay I, for me Mondays are busy because I have so and so or I have this to do correct and I find like I said the first couple of times you set it up it's very very hard but it's all on you to respect your own boundaries right Absolutely. like if you, if you set it up if you said for example like hey like you said, don't call me after five, and they call. If you pick it up, well, that's on you. Absolutely, and, and they know they're for a fact to call again. Exactly, yeah. they're like, wow, he doesn't respect his own boundaries, Absolutely. so I could just abuse it. Absolutely. So some of the things we've talked about is as far as like you know, folks listening here, what can we do to you know start gaining that emotional intelligence for you when you're setting up. Uh, a brand new workshop or what have you? How do you evaluate where everybody's at? Sort of like the or gauge the room as far as like where is everybody at and what can we do to kind of get them to where they need to be so I actually I don't gauge the room because there's different personalities within that room regardless mm -hmm. but what I do is I create activities that will bring out the issues that different people have and it will allow them to see what their issues are and them to problem solve because if I'm problem solving for them or if I'm saying um, again I'm not a psychologist I'm not going to go to each individual and say this is your issue this is your issue especially in a group setting um, having said that you, people's personalities come out in yeah. these workshops within like the activities for example there was once this activity that I did with a, I think it was about 40 individuals and the activity involved in people getting into teams yeah. and building a puzzle with the person who's building the puzzle has to wear a blindfold Mm. and everyone else has to describe how they need to put the puzzle pieces together. Now, it seems maybe a little bit silly or simple, but the reality is everyone has a different perspective. They're all sitting in different ways, and now they have to communicate in a way that the person with the blindfold on has to understand. Otherwise, yeah. they will not be able to actually put all the puzzle pieces together. And it's very interesting, interesting to see how people's personalities come out when that happens that's when you really find out like uh you know folks that are patient or impatient i don't want to say the word asshole but like in a way like that just like that narcissistic. sort of narcissistic behavior starts to come out like it's right in front of you can't you see it well obviously can't see it well, i've no, got a blindfold, blindfold on. on exactly so it's just the way that like the you know this is when you start seeing how people are not able to kind of put themselves in somebody else's shoes. Exactly. And empathy for me is that ability to be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and go, Absolutely. man, I really feel for them. A hundred percent. This is what's going on and I'm just going to try to put myself in their shoes for just about two minutes. That's compassion. But you don't have to go and fix it for them. You nope. just have to feel it. You have to feel it and understand it again from their perspective yeah. and the solutions that need to be applied need to be applied from their perspective as well again i'll repeat this i know i said this at the beginning of the the show empathy according to research is the key leadership skill according to organizational behavior psychology and it's not surprising because Whoever says emotional intelligence or soft skills are soft, they're actually extremely hard. Mm -hmm. It's extremely hard to basically tell your parents, your siblings, people that you really care about, what your boundaries are. Yeah. It's extremely hard oh, to do that. Oh, it is. It's and just the more like, you love them, yeah. the harder it is. The harder it gets because also, uh, especially if you've lived with them for a long time <laughs> and you know the boundaries were never set properly, no. Now, all of a sudden, what's happening? Why are you setting those boundaries? Like, what's Absolutely. going on? Absolutely. They don't even think of it as boundaries. They think of it as what's gotten into you. And and you can take that small little example and apply it to the larger work organizational yeah. group. And I, I'm smiling because I know that you have, you know, several brothers. I have sisters. And it's very interesting to see that a lot of people who didn't have the experiences that we had actually struggle a little bit when it comes to not just set, not setting boundaries, but accepting boundaries. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to see. So Yeah, and that's, that's another thing too, is like accepting boundaries. Like a lot of us are not used to 
having those boundaries no. set. So when not when you grew up in a big family. Exactly. So when <laughs> those boundaries are now family. set, then you're like, what is going on? Like I'm, I'm not yeah. used to this. Yeah. Um, but you have to respect people's boundaries in order to respect yours. Absolutely. And also, it's it's the idea is so that you can continue to achieve the goals that you want to achieve and be functional and healthy. And when I say healthy, I don't mean just physical. I mean mentally healthy because mm-hmm. um, that comes along with it. And the more healthy you are in terms of, you know, emotional health, mental health, physical health, the more you're able to achieve the things that you want to achieve. Yeah. And the reason I keep talking about achieving the things that you want to achieve, I don't mean just about um, achieving financial status or that I also mean being able to accomplish, let's say you want to lose weight or you want to work out or you want to start a community group or you want to have better relationship with your siblings or your parents or your significant other. All of these things mm-hmm. are going to help. I'll give you an example actually on the losing weight I've lost recently, about 85 pounds and Bravo. over four yeah. years. You're doing uh, One of the biggest things that was a challenge for me is that how folks were, you know, like kind of, always that talk that self-talk that i used to kind of have for myself but the, the problem is that self-talk also comes in from other people talking to you and letting you know that like you know can she lose some weight like what do you you know that kind of stuff yeah. when you start setting up boundaries and saying like look i'm seeing myself as as healthy and this and that and then you start eating healthy and you start kind of like for example a big one was with my mom like just trying to tell her like this is not going to work for me yeah going over and visiting and saying like I'm sorry, I can't eat this food. Like, yeah. It's not part of my <laughs> diet that I'm on. Or That's like the, the, a hard you know, one, telling your mom that you're not boundaries. going to eat exactly. her food that she what cooked. What do you mean you can't eat I this mean, food? I'm pretty sure a lot of people in the audience can relate to this. Yeah. That's probably one of the hardest things. It's just being able to, you know, to bring out and, and say, like, those are my boundaries. Yeah. This is what I can eat and this is what I can't Absolutely. eat. Absolutely. And could you please respect it? Absolutely. As simple as that. But then we're like, well, what do you mean? And then you fast forward a little bit now that I've lost the weight, they're, they're actually looking at it going, well, you're right. We should have respected that from the beginning. From the I'm beginning. really sorry for not respecting it. And then they start getting behind you too. They're like, yeah. we, wanna, we, want, we want you to teach us what it, you just exactly. did. What, what did you do? What did you do? <laughs> All it was just setting boundaries for Absolutely. yourself and respecting those boundaries and then enforcing those boundaries on yourself first so people can actually respect them. I think I need to bring you into the organization <laughs> because you're doing a really good job well, describing it. Tell me a little bit more about some of the ways that people can actually engage with you. <laughs> What's the easiest way to engage with you? Oh, well, I, be... I can be reached uh, over email. Mm-hmm. I have a website, Spark Empathy, and I'm also available on Instagram as well under Spark Empathy as well. Fantastic. So we've been you know, friends for about 20 some years here. And I've noticed and a we're shift. Just Twenty years old. You know, I've noticed a massive shift with with you as personality and all of that, and the growth as well. Tell me a little bit more about your background that you bring to Spark Empathy that got you where you are today. So um, I'll give you a bit about my background. I won't go into the part where I've moved. You know, lived in Canada, lived in Lebanon, and lived in different countries because I think that added a lot to my growth. Absolutely, struggle is. Makes Struggle, us who we are. Absolutely. But I would say that in terms of the work that I did to get myself here, I studied conflict. I did my master's in conflict resolution. I uh, received a certification in third party neutral training, which involves mediation, facilitation, and that sort of thing from the Canadian Institute for Conflict Resolution. And I also received uh, certifications in mediation and conflict coaching as well. Mm-hmm. I've done multiple workshops within the community for the federal government and I've also done a lot of coaching in a political setting as well to individuals in those in, in those um, areas I'm not your sure what resume I is uh, quite significant well, tell me a little bit more <laughs> so what's next for Spark Empathy so like I said earlier for me Spark Empathy is a, it's an organization that I'm hoping I'm really hoping that you know the next generation will take it on and maybe even kind of extend it into uh, different spaces where we're able to offer free training to individuals of need. Ultimately, that's the goal that I would like to have. But for now, it's just uh, providing services to people in the Ottawa region, also internationally but virtual, and uh, being able to just uh, learn from the workshops that I'm doing right now um, through feedback, 
basically tailoring things to, to be able to benefit those that want to take it. Mm -hmm. And if we were to just like talk about conflict resolution in general, like just, um, you know, if, if someone is having an issue, having a conflict with a family member uh, or a boss or what have you, what are some of the steps that they should take on their own? Like, you know, yep. again, not everybody has the ability to hire you or Absolutely. what have you. Absolutely. What would you suggest for those individuals to start looking into? So I would say those individuals need to probably uh, work on mindfulness, self-reflection, and self-management. And that, you're absolutely right. I would say the majority of people would be able to do that because if they are to apply that to the, themselves, they might find that there is an issue that they have mm -hmm. that they need to kind of fix. There's a lot of free online tools as well where you can go online and you can actually do surveys and be able to figure out things about your emotional intelligence. For example... People with high empathy tend to score very low on problem solving. And the reason that is, is because they're always extending themselves. And then there's people who have very high problem solving skills that are very low on the empathy side. So they're used to just kind of doing things their way all the time. So a lot of these tools that are provided on the online that are free will be very helpful. They call them psycho, psychometric assessments. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of psychometric assessments that people can do yeah. that would help give them an idea. It's interesting. And, it, and books too, yeah. of course. No, no, it's very interesting because I find a lot of times like when, when there's conflict between individuals, Sometimes it might just be one person projecting on the other. Absolutely. And sometimes there is actual true conflict. There is sort of two different, uh, you know, polarities, two yeah. different side of views, and then it's just not meshing. Absolutely. But it does help to really kind of sit there and, and say, why am I upset? What's upsetting me? What is it exactly that's upsetting me? It's not necessarily the fact that he said this or she said this. or There's a what little bit more deep-rooted issues Absolutely. here that I need to kind of figure out. Is this a me issue? Or is it a you issue? Kind of thing? I would say 90% of conflicts are, are that. One of the things that we see a lot in the organization that I uh, work with um, at, out of St. Paul is that a lot of conflicts are between uh, uh, neighbors and very small conflicts. But it's a, it's, yeah. these are issues that last for a very long time and sometimes they can end up really bad. And sometimes people move uh, out of that neighborhood because they're not able to handle the conflict that they have with their neighbors. It's, it's crazy how conflicts with neighbors sometimes can be a small little thing that could turn into you know, a massive uh, land feud and sometimes Absolutely. a massive genocide. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad to say, but it is, it is what it is. I absolutely agree with you. And, and honestly, that conflict... Uh, coaching and the conflict resolution piece you know I talk a lot about it in terms of like the organizational uh, structure but yes it can be applied to international conflict as well and it can be applied to just people's ability to understand yeah what other people are going through and just to give you a very quick example I had someone who asked me who was, um, I was engaging with uh, a person who was talking about the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, not sure how much I can talk about that here, but I mean, a conflict resolution is my thing. It's conflict resolution. And uh, that person happened to be Israeli, and they said, well, I don't understand why empathy is so important. And I had a very good conversation with this person and, and basically explained to them, empathy is important on both sides because I'm able to sit down and understand what you're going through and why you're going through that, even though it's very different mm -hmm. than what I'm dealing with. And vice versa, it allows you to understand where I'm coming from and yeah. what I'm dealing with. The biggest thing I find when it comes to like, um, you know, conflict and then, you know, we get to that step where it's like a truth and reconciliation yeah. kind of thing is literally just feeling what the other person had felt at the time. Absolutely. And if you can both get on that same page, oh my God, he's feeling this way? Yeah. And I'm feel I'm horrible. Well, I'm not horrible, but that's just, I didn't know how they're feeling. Yep. Yeah. Now that I do, I feel like garbage. Yep. Yeah. And then just being able to just kind of come on that same page and like actually relate to one another and humanize one another. A hundred percent. It's really where the conflict will get resolved it's, regardless. It's, it's the recognition aspect. Yeah. It's being able to kind of recognize what that person had gone through. And, you know, it, like I said, it could be 
international scale, it could be micro scale. On the micro scale, it's something like this. Let's say uh, you had a huge accident, your car was totaled. I'm pretty sure I'm hitting on some <laughs> soft spots here, but yeah. your car is totaled. And then someone comes up to you that day and says, oh man, I got a $10 parking ticket. You're going to look at them and be like, I just, my car just got totaled, yeah. right? I'm lucky to be alive. You're, I'm lucky to be alive. Now, I will argue the scale of both are completely different. But if for a moment you're able to just say, you know what, that really sucks. I remember a time where I got a ticket and it, it wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. And then get, they need to give you the space to say, you know, today I just had a really huge car accident. So if I can't give you the space to empathize with you right now. And they might say, oh, wait, I get it. And I think that piece alone yeah. would solve so many problems. But unfortunately... Not everyone has that. No, and that's the thing. Like, a lot of us are just born with that. I don't want to say born with it. Uh, okay. But we get into our own head, yeah. and then that selfishness of, like, this is how I'm feeling, this is how I'm feeling. Well, can you, for one behavior. second, yeah. put yourself aside and feel what the other person is feeling? And that's really empathy. Yep. And what you said was very right, though. You said some of us are just born with that. You're right. We are born with that. And that's why emotional intelligence is a skill that you can actually practice mm -hmm. and increase it can be decreased and increased we all have the capacity for empathy as human beings even the most narcissistic person has the capacity for empathy and i say that not as a diagnosis i mean i'm not diagnosing if someone has narcissistic personality disorder that's completely different what i'm talking about is if they have narcissistic behavior they still have the capacity for empathy yeah and so sometimes it could be just as simple as them putting their phone down every time they're having conversation with another individual. That phone is a huge thing for a lot of people when it comes to communication oh, and conversation. I'm one of those people that are actually like, if I'm talking to you and you hold your phone, I'm going to walk away. Yep. And I've done it so many times where people are like, for you. really? Yep. Because at the end of the day, look, if I'm giving you the most valuable asset of my life, which is time. Yes. You sure as heck need to give me that same respect. I Simple as totally that. agree with you. And if you can't, we're not friends. Absolutely. And that's, see, that's your emotional intelligence, understanding that certain relationships are basically not good for you. I would call those toxic relationships. Mm -hmm. When people are not respecting your boundaries, when they're not respecting your time, they're definitely toxic towards you. They could be amazing people. I'm not saying they, they're bad people. They could be amazing people. But the fact that they're not respecting your time, which, like you said, is probably one of the most valuable assets that it's, anyone it's has. the only asset that you cannot replace. That no one can replace. I mean, exactly. this like, is... <laughs> here goes another second. Yeah, pretty much. You know what I mean? Like, that's it. I'm not going to get it back. Here goes another second. Uh -huh. Simple yeah. as that. So if I'm spending that with you and I'm paying attention to you, all I expect is the same sort of in return. Reciprocation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Reciprocation, I think, is the highest form of sort of love yeah when you're reciprocating to somebody what they're giving out yep you're just simply saying i see you and i appreciate you yep absolutely and this is why we're such good friends <laughs> absolutely look garam really appreciate you being on the show it's uh, it's fantastic it's i know we've been Thank trying you. to do this for quite some time and we could you and i can sit there and talk probably for freaking 10 days in yeah, a row and we're still well, not well, bored longer. we've been doing this for about 25 <laughs> years uh really appreciate it thank you so much and I i'd love for you. the audience to reach out to you if they have any questions any concerns and also for you guys at home really appreciate it if you like the show give us a thumbs up don't forget to hit the subscribe because if this way we can get every single episode that comes out, you'll get the little bell icon. It shows you businesses around Ottawa and what we can do. And, and hopefully we can try to show you that Ottawa is not a boring city. It's fantastic. There's so much to do here. And if, it's, if you think it's boring, reach out and I'll tell you why. Thanks again. <laughs> Appreciate it. With Fatty here, it's not boring. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.